done. I don't forget to hit record. Okay, I got it. Just did All it. All right. And then if anybody has any questions as we're going, just put it in the chat box and we'll stop periodically. Okay, everyone. All right. So this is my first attempt at now. Can everybody see me? I guess is my question. Because all I see is Jeannie right now. Uh, admit. Okay, what I'm going to do is go to share screen. And I'm going to show you this. All right, folks, here we go. There we are. All right, now. Um, okay, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us today for this presentation on how to use the science of reading in your balanced literacy classroom. There's been such a surge of teachers new to the science and they are asking how I can do this in my classroom. So I thought that perhaps we could review some strategies and approaches that you can implement to help improve results for kids. All right, why is that not working? If you just hit the arrow, Donna, it'll help you go to the next slide. It didn't. Okay, so let's go. First, I wanna say that this, that um, teacher training is the very most important thing for you to do. Hands down, get yourself trained. Um, SOR is unlike any traditional teacher training that you have re received in spite of the research being around for 30 or 40 years. So think about that, 30 or 40 years and we're still trying to get the word out on the best way to approach uh, reading. Today will be just some ideas that you can implement to help you reach more of your struggling readers and writers. Okay, so uh, I think Jeannie already mentioned, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, and also I designed this PowerPoint with tons and tons of videos, connected links. So we don't have time today to go through them. Um, so there's a couple, probably two, three hours more with the links. If you take a, if you actually take the time to look at the links, um, you will, uh, what do we have here? Okay, no one's in. Um, you will see that there's a lot more to this presentation that you can learn from, okay? So why is that not working? Oh, this drives me crazy. <sighs> It worked this afternoon. There we go. It's doing the wrong arrow. So we talked about uh, teacher knowledge being key. And um, we are hosting some trainings. Next month, a teacher training using the fundamentals of literacy instruction and assessment book will be starting. This is basically a textbook writ written by Susan Smart and Marty Haugen. Uh, it's the second edition. What I really like about the book is that it really is a, um, a basic um, start for people that are new to the science of reading. And um, it hits a 10 week class spread over from September to December, covering 10 chapters and it's being led by the authors of the chapters. Uh, it's designed for those new to the science this will be advertised on both the Science of Reading page and the Fundamentals page. There is a new Facebook Fundamentals of Literacy Instruction. And um, I gotta check and see if there's anybody who wants to get in. I don't know. Anyway, okay, so um, the next one is uh, Top 10 Tools and I am in the middle of this. Jeannie is, uh, David is, I don't know who else who's on here is, um, and we've been, we're almost done. Um, it's been amazing, I have to say. What I really liked about it is that she takes the science and puts uh, pl practical applications for you to use into your, in your classroom. So it's really a great um, understanding of, of the research and how you can implement that in your classroom. It's only $25 a month. You could probably finish in two to three months to do it, or to do it right. Um, if you want, you could take it for a whole year. The next one is letters. Um, letter stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. 
It is the gold standard um, available between I think six and seven hundred dollars. Yep, or and it can take you can take up to two years to finish it. It's written by Dr. Louisa Motes. Uh, all of these are excellent. There, there are many, many others um, that are approved by IDA, uh, which is great. Um, I just didn't list them here, but you know that's probably a whole nother webinar we could do on that. Okay, so let's talk about structured literacy. Um, what is it? That, that's really what the science is all about. It's, it's connecting the research to, um, to practice. And cognitive and neuroscientists have studied the brain and the optimal ways that children learn. Using explicit, systematic, and sequential approaches will yield the best results. So what does that mean? Explicit means directly taught. You're not asking the kids to think about what would you say, give me some examples. You're just telling them what it is. Um, there's no guessing. The teacher simply states the information being taught. Next, it's done in a systematic way, which means the lesson format will be the same every day. And what that does for kids, when you know, uh, when the students know what's expected of them in each part of the lesson, Familiarity of the lesson formats and routines improves learning because they, they know what's coming, they know what to expect, they're more engaged in, in their learning. Sequential means that a scope and sequence of the material, material being taught builds upon the previous lesson and is reviewed and integrated into the new skill resulting in student growth. So that's, it's constantly being revisited, being applied, then you add another skill, revisit it, being applied, add another skill. It's that constant um, review and application of the skill. W doing that results in cementing that knowledge. Uh, we also, um, let's see, prompt corrective feedback is important and use of decodable text until the child is ready to transition to non-controlled text, and we're going to talk about that later. Okay, so what is the problem? Good. What? Good. You're good. Let me see. I'm, I'm thinking there's probably people who want to get in. Maybe not. There's 23 participants, so I don't know how that happened. All right. I don't know. Keep going. I'm going. So what's the problem with the three queuing system? Um, I'm gonna reduce that. Okay, um, so the three queuing system is semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic. Semantic means meaning. Syntax is the language structure, words in order, if they make sense. And the graphophonic is the spelling and the phonics. Okay. So the three queuing system is often used in balanced literacy classrooms. Its structure is the semantic meaning syntactic word sequence. I already said that, sorry. And um, you typically hear this in the prompts, does it look right, sound right, make sense? Why is this approach problematic for, for students? The problem is, is that through brain research, it's been discovered that when we read the orthographic part of the brain and phonological part activate first. Okay, poor readers rely on meaning most, sorry, the brain wants to decode first with sounds, not use meaning for decoding. In the three queuing system, that's just the opposite of what we should be doing. We're focusing on getting meaning first by stepping the understanding or the use of the sounding out. What happens there is um, poor readers rely on meaning, most likely due to their limited pull of sight words and poor phonics decoding skills. So context is needed to grasp the meaning of multiple words after you've decoded the word. Okay, I'm sorry I'm being so choppy. This is driving me crazy. Here we go, let's go to the next one. The brain has four processors. 
when I first learned this model, when I first learned this model, I couldn't believe how crystal clear learning to read became for me. The phonological sounds of letters down here, phonemic awareness with the orthographic processor. So orthographic, for those who are new to the science, ortho means straight. Just like you go to an orthodontist and they put braces on your teeth. Why do they do that? To make them straight. Graphic means to write. But really orthographic is really spelling. Is if you translate it, it's spelling. Okay. Um, and this is sound and the phonemic awareness. Okay. Skilled reading does not. I'm sorry. Skilled reading does not require this part up here. We can we just could focus down here and become a skilled decoder. But then to get the meaning, we go to the meaning processor here. To further get the meaning, we go to the contextual processor. You have to use this so you can figure out this, like in the word um, D-O-V-E. It could be dove or dove, depending on how it's used and where it's used in the sentence, okay? So, uh, we want to know, Skilled reading does not require context. So this is why we test kids on nonsense words. And I know that's a big um, problem for people who are not used to the science. You know, oh, we don't need to use some nonsense words, but we do because nonsense words are a true indicator of if, if that child has the code. Can that child figure out the code? And that's why we use them. Um, Testing kids with grade level word list is not a true indicator of their reading skills. It's an indicator that they have orthograph orthographically mapped those words to be stored in the brain. But the brain holds only about 5,000 words. Students must be taught letter, graphing, sound blending to become a proficient reader. Okay, this enables them to read all words through sounds and graphemes along with morphology and learning the patterns. Okay. So if we, if we use, if we don't um, teach kids to use this processing first and we go straight to the meaning, we're missing the base. We're missing the base. And that, that is truly uh, problematic for kids. This slide speaks for itself. And yet this is what whole language and balanced literacy is based upon. They're going for the uh, word recognition um, without sounding it out, okay? Word recognition through context. So what do we do about that? We're gonna stop the three cueing and sound it out. It'd be advantageous for you to take down any cueing systems you have in your classroom or your virtual classroom. Um, you know, the animal cues that are being used, uh, simply, you know, just don't use them. Um, it's very simple what you want kids to do. Let's look here. Here's an example of a bookmark that you can buy. It's not my favorite. Um, look through the whole word. Again, we want kids to look from the beginning to the end. Use your finger to point to each of the sounds. Ask for help if you don't know. We're going to kind of skip that one right now. Blend the sounds and link to the letter or letter strings you see. Listen to your own voice and think about the word. Okay, so what you can do is definitely we could reduce this down to three, uh, three steps. Look at the whole word, sound it out, 
Does that make sense? We do want to get the meaning in there because kids, that's why they're reading. Okay. All right. Now this is where I always have trouble getting back to my. Exit out, Donna. All right. Go away. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then you want to reread the sentence the word is in with the corrected word. You do want to double check and make sure that that child is putting the meaning uh, of the word that they just decoded back into the sentence. Uh, they can reread the word or reread the whole sentence. If, if the decoding time took them a long time, you know, five, six, seven seconds, they've lost that drift of that sentence, you know, the gist. So you want them to go back and reread. Uh, and then you can say, does that word make sense? Okay. Phonological awareness is the bedrock of reading. So how do we become proficient readers? Phonological awareness and phonemic awareness is the awareness that words are made up of chunks and sounds. It's the foundation to become a proficient reader and speller. It really is counterintuitive intuitive to think that something that we hear is needed for something that we see. There are two curriculums at each, um, oh, I'm on the wrong slide, sorry. Here we go. There are two, oh, I'm not on the wrong slide, there we go. Um, there are two curriculums that talk about this. Adding Hegarty program is a quick and easy way to add routine to your day. Um, this curriculum is a five day a week explicit and sequential program available for grades 4K through grade one. However, I want to caution you, we know that PA does not fully develop to the advanced stages until ages nine or beyond. So this curriculum is appropriate at any level and even adulthood. The Equip for Reading Success, um, Oops. Okay, this is what that, that curriculum looks like. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, or hopefully many of you are. This book in, also includes PA activities, but in my opinion, it is more highly focused on the deficit area. So let's say it's um, uh, compound words or beginning sounds or um, middle sounds or um, omission of sounds, very specific deficits. Whereas this program is a curriculum that teaches all of it in a sequential way. In my opinion, this is more of a tier one type of instruction. You would use this every day in your classroom. This mm -hmm. to me, Kilpatrick's work would be used after you're seeing some continual problems. This child just can't get it. It's more for small group instruction, for individualized instruction, uh, because you, there is a test that's associated with it that um, you can give that super highly focuses on what um, needs to be taught. So this, this test, this past test is free. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the link for it, but all you need to do is Google Equip for Reading Success past test. It'll come up. It, 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 um, Kilpatrick downloaded, I believe it's chapter 11 of his book and it's all free. So the test is free. The directions are free. What's in this book are ideas and um, activities for the phonemic awareness activities, okay? Now, this um, is really what is what Kilpatrick based his work on. This is free. It's called uh, Perceptual Skills Curriculum by Rosner, Auditory Motor Skills, and He's got all kinds of activities you can do in here. So for example, continue the same game. Okay, compound words, okay. Play, ground. Um, you can say, say playground, but don't say play. Things like that. 
Um, and this was, I think, put out in the 70s, maybe. Um, so it's free right now. 73, yep. And um, it's available to be used in case you can't afford. People, uh, down all the way to the title. There you go. People want to look. People want to write that down. Okay. Oh, I have a note here from Kilpatrick. This PDF is taken from the Rosner Auditory. Can you guys see that? This yellow note? Yeah, well, go ahead. Just Auditory ahead. Motor Skill Curriculum and Early Predecessor of the Equip for Reading Success Program. Because, of, because it was developed based upon a US government grant, it became public domain in 1983. And as you can see on the copyright page, this is no longer how such grants work, but that's how they worked back then. This means these materials are, are available for free copying and distribution. That's good for us, that's for sure. Okay. All right. So that takes us to um, what is orthographic mapping? I know that's like a new buzzword hanging around here. Well, it, it's a big deal. Orthographic mapping is a, it's a big deal because we know how the brain processes and stores words for instant and effortless retrieval. I'm going to say that again. We know how the brain processes and stores words for instant and effortless retrieval. The brain must walk through each letter in order to, for it to be mapped or stored. So when a, when a child comes to a word they don't know, they are using their eyes to go through each letter. That, even though you think they're reading it as a whole, they are not. The brain is processing each individual letter to the point where it becomes so automatic, the brain doesn't have to do that anymore. And it goes off to this place and sits there. And you can't undo that word once you, you've got it. You can't. They, there's a test that, I can't even remember the name of the test, but you're supposed to look at the color word, and but the color word is different than the actual color of the word. You can't, you're constantly wanting to read the word because your brain has mapped that word and you can't take it out, okay? Try not reading a word you know, it's nearly impossible to do. Now, Kids that have intact orthographic mapping have all the stars aligned and they get it and they come to school and they get it. All they need is one to four exposures to a word to remember it. That's just it. That's it. So what about those kiddos that can't remember the word was or can't remember the word said? You all know and love them well, right? We've got those kids. So what's going on with them? So those kids that, are, that have that difficulty are referred to having a phonological core deficit. They have difficulty at the advanced phonemic st stages and probably the, um, the, the simple stages resulting in poor orthographic mapping and storing words for efficient retrieval. Okay, now I'm not gonna go, let's see. Um, what's my time like here? Okay. Uh, it's 4.25 right now, Donna. All right. Um, I don't want to watch this whole thing, but... Um, the links are there. Yep. Can you guys see this? Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's an example. Um, I don't know how to connect, but there it goes. Here's an example of someone teaching orthographic mapping of a word that is not, can't really be sounded out. I think the word is could. Do we have to do our best, best in reading? I just think we can still do our best. best. Okay. Or can we just do our regular handwriting? You're just going to write. Okay. All right. So we're going to work today, um, boys and girls, boy and girl, the boy and girls, <laughs> with some tricky words. Okay. And these are sight words. These are words that you should know as soon as you see them. Okay. But they are kind of tricky because the sounds in them don't always correspond to the letters that we know, okay? So I'd like you to say this word with me, could. 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 Okay, now, 
when we work with our words, don't we, we put, put our fists down and we count our sounds, right? So let's do that. Ready? Could. 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 Okay, how many sounds do you hear? Three. Three sounds. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our markers and we're going to move our markers down to the space, to the gray spaces. Okay? Okay, now we're going to touch the first sound and we're going to say that sound, then we're going to touch the second sound, say that sound, and then the third sound. Ready? We're going to just do the word put. Ready? Cuck. Could. And we can, whoops, sorry about that. We're going to swipe it across and go could. All right? All right, now watch me. Now put your markers down for right now. I want you to watch me. How many sounds do you hear in could? Three. I hear three sounds as well. Now, when I show you this word, you're going to be like, wow, Miss Cad, this is the word could? Okay, so watch me. <laughs> this is the word could. Okay? All right, let's spell the word could. Ready? C O U L D. Okay, so what is what sound do you think says cook? C. Yeah, so let's say that cook. Ready? Cook. <laughs> what letters do you think might say uh? What do you think says uh? O U. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The O U. I knew it was okay? going to be. What do you think is going to say D? L D. L D. There you go. Fantastic. The L D. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's let's spell this word again. Ready? C O U L D. And swipe it across and say could. Okay, now I'm going to take this word and I'm going to put it down. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write the letters that are responsible for the sounds that you hear that are right below the markers. Okay, so, so let's put it down. Okay. Now let's write the sounds, write the letters that are responsible for the sounds in this word. All right, so what, let's say, let's say our first sound, ready? Cup, uh, uh, duck, could. could. Okay, let's spell it now. Okay, what did you notice about this teacher, what she was doing wrong? Oh, they, oh, they can't talk. Wait right. a minute. How do I do this? Well, they're putting it in the chat. Oh, okay. So there is also, um, restate your question, Donna. Have them put it in the chat. All right, what was this teacher doing wrong? With what, I'll give you a hint. It was how she was saying the sounds. So Helen said, this is, not, this is also an example of how not to pronounce the sounds. Exactly. I am hearing vowel insertions exactly. after the sound. So she was going, cuh, uh, d. That right. was, you know, the C sound. The C sound. Stop, right? And she'd be, yeah. So, um, so that's just an example of what of what orthographic mapping. It is not the best example. Um, I think there's a better and efficient, more efficient ways of doing it. But um, it's all there was on the internet. So anyway, okay, let's keep going. So Alconan boxes. Um, let's see, where am I? How how can we teach kids about sounds and words and how to sequence those sounds? Using Alconan boxes or just lines on a page can help. In the beginning, you can use just the right amount of boxes to train the students. So let's say there are only two here. Um, so you would go, uh, uh, all right? It's kind of a giveaway. It's kind of like giving them the answer. But when you're training kids, again, we want to be explicit and we want to be systematic. So we're going to give them just the first, you know, we would, wouldn't have these boxes here. So let's say it was cat, k, at, the three sounds. And then eventually when they get really good, you could do st, a, m, p, stamp. Okay? Just that sounding out that there's individual sounds here uh, making up words. So let's say it was um, Let's say the word was lip. We would go u, i, p. But let's say the word is um, shop. Sh, op. Okay, we have a graphing here of sh. It gets one box, one sound. All right. You can do this with chips, and not chips that you eat. 
<laughs> Although that wouldn't be a bad idea, but you know, just little markers here. You can also start substituting, you can start using letters, and I would use just one color of letters. Don't use multicolors, don't use um, you know, different colors for the vowels. You don't want to give that away. You want all the letters to be the same color. And I'm going to tell you what Dr. Kilpatrick says about this. We've always been told that phonemic awareness is something you do in the dark. You don't need to see it. However, um, Dr. Kilpatrick states in his manual that phonemic awareness should not be trained as an isolated skill. Unless students are able to apply their phoneme awareness skills to the process of mapping sounds to letters, you will not see the benefits of phoneme awareness training. This is especially true of students who develop phoneme awareness skills later and as a result of remedial instruction. They need to see the connection between sounds and letters. So I think that's really important to remember. You're just not going to teach this, take out your Hegarty book, do your lesson and call it a day. You want to make that apply in your instruction when you're doing reading, uh, when you're doing spelling. Applying it and making it um, practical. Um, I have a demo here with David in it. Um, I think I'm going to skip it for now because I think we're running out of time. Um, but David does a really nice job with that. Okay. So word chains with and without letters. Um, okay, so this would be, so when we're doing this, we're adding, so let's say the words wrap, er, at. Well, I'm gonna use the, I'm gonna use the big one. I, I like going with the big one because I don't wanna give away my, my answer, but if you're teaching young ones and you want that explicitly teach them, use just the few boxes. So the word is wrap or app, change wrap to ramp. So they would have er, amp, okay? You could also have them write the letters in here or they can grab the letters that are in a box up here. I call it the parking lot. If you just had a box here and they can grab the letters they need to make the word, okay? But these word chains are really great. And we got a bunch of them when we did our top 10 tools from Deb Gla uh, Glazer. And this is one of the examples. So wrap turns to ramp, so we inserted. Ramp turns to ramp, so we deleted. Ram turns to rim, so we substituted. Rim turns to trim, so we added. And you get the picture, okay? This is really hard for some kids, super, super hard. The advanced phonemic awareness. Okay, now, um, if anyone's not familiar with Reading Simplified, I really like this program because it, it accelerates the phonemic awareness process with kids. Um, OG can t sometimes be a real slow drip method. But if we're able to identify kids early on and remediate them early on, we can do it in a much more efficient manner. So Marnie Ginsburg actually is a Wisconsin, um, she's not a native, but she comes from Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, and she, um, her company is called Reading Simplified. She's a researcher and she also, has developed this, this system. Um, she's told me that this program was based on the phonographics program that Kilpatrick has endorsed in his book. So why don't you take a look at this. Sorry. Right. 
You guys have eyelashes, but we're just gonna go the word lash. 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 Sound down and say it. Very nice. Let me hear the sounds. And the word is bingo. Okay, let's switch lash to lush. When something is lush, it is full. Like a, a lush garden is a full garden with lots of flowers. So switch it from lash to lush. lush. What sound is it? Lush. Uh, very good. Okay, let's check the sounds. And the word is? Did you hear those sounds? Let me hear. Nice. Okay. How about, are you ready to make flush? Don't forget to flush the toilet. Okay. <laughs> flush, we're going to have to add something to make lush into flush. What are you going to add? Flush. Well, what sound are you pulling down? Oh, I like how you fix that. Nicely done. Okay, let me hear the sounds. And the word is lush. Okay, let's do the sounds together, everybody. Uh, awesome. Flash. If you have a picture and you uh, in the dark and you want to make some light, you may turn on the flash on the camera. Okay, get the picture. Um, we're also finding out now that... Um, it's better to do more of a blended approach instead of oh, ush. Research is showing that you're better off doing a blended. So she would say flush. You hear I'm, I'm blending those sounds instead of segmenting them. It's showing that the, the research is showing that you get better results when you're doing a blended as opposed to a segmented just wanted to give you a heads up on that okay so diagnostic assessments digging deeper um, so how do we know what kids need often i see districts do this rti model rti model this is what they do at the beginning of the year they give benchmark testing kids that are in red get an intervention usually for fluency an intervention such as repeated re readings is given to increase fluency. Well, what's wrong with this picture? Not enough information. What is causing a child's rate to be slower than expected? A good diagnostic test needs to be given to all students that are under the expected reading level. So what does that look like? 80% of students with lower reading rates have a decoding deficit. Diagnostic testing on the child's knowledge of letter and sound should be given. Really great reading provides a free diagnostic form to use for most grade levels. And that's what this is. I don't want to click on, well, I guess I could click on it. Um, they have, it's all free, complimentary assessments for all the different grade levels. And um, you just can't beat it. It's, it's really great. Um, it's important that you, as the teacher, drill down to the needs of each student. Getting scores from the beginning, middle, and end of the year that may or may not be accurate isn't enough. You need to dig deeper to see where the child's deficits are. You have to ask yourself, is the child having decoding issues, language comprehension issues, or both? Okay, so let's talk about... Sight words. Donna, can you repeat that? You said 80%, right? Right. Repeat that again. 80% of kids, students with lower reading rates have a decoding deficit. Okay, so I don't know about you, but back in the day, um, a sight word was different than what we call a sight word now. Okay, a sight word was, you know, the dolch list, the fry list. Um, I can't think of any others, but we drilled it ad nauseum to these kids. And they still couldn't read, all right? That's why orthographic mapping has really been like 
like the greatest invention of the 20th century or 21st century because um, now we know what's going on with kids. All words eventually become sight words if you can read them instantly. Okay. Um, Stephanie Stoller did a blog and she said, um, every word wants to be a sight word when it grows up. I just love that. High frequency words are the most commonly used words in our daily communication. So the words like and, the, that, this, those are high frequency, said, okay? A new model for teaching high frequency words. This is put out by Really Great Reading, I think. No, Readsters, Readsters. And um, they talk about heart words. So again, I'm dating myself. Back in the day, we called them heart words because you had to remember them by heart. I don't know if they use that term anymore in school. I mean, you can, you can tell kids that you, learning it by heart means you just know it instantly. But this is a, um, a, a uh, article that will tell you um, exactly about heart words what the sight words is, the, the frequency words, 10 sight words for pre-readers to learn. So they say to start off with just these 10, the, a, i, to, and, was, for, you, is, and of, and then you can build from there. Um, flash words and heart words defined. It's a really super good article, okay? All right. So what else do we need to know? We need to have a, uh, a scope and sequence. Remember we talked about sequence being important in the science of reading. Here are two examples of the sequence we can use for phoneme and grapheme introduction. Remember a grapheme is one or more letters that represents a, phone, uh, a phoneme. For example, F can be, the, the f sound can be PH, it can be GH, um, or the I sound can be spelled I-G-H, that's a grapheme, or T is just by itself, it's just T or T. It's extremely important to align your instruction in a sequential way, whether it is with phonemes or teaching writing. A sequential approach built upon learned and applied skills will give your students the skills and practice they will thrive on. That is really the trick to getting kids to be proficient is that explicit, systematic, and sequential approach. Okay, here's another example of a scope and sequence that's available through 95% group. Um, all you have to do is Google, you know, um, scope and sequence. But what I would recommend that you do is that you find yourself a, if you're going to use decodable text, and I highly recommend that you do, is that your decodable text scope and sequence aligns with your scope and sequence that you're using in instruction. So that's why it's really advantageous for you to have a program that has all that built into it. You know, you get your decodable books. Um, book set A is short vowels. Set B is B dash E. You know, you just know what's going to be taught and then you'll know what to expect kids to know. Decodable, re oops. Decodable readers are necessary for beginning readers. This is a blog by um, All About Learning Press, and she talks about why they're important. Um, I guess what I would say is that the reason we want to start with decodable readers is to break down the visual word and get kids to be able to read um, in, uh, at their level where they're able to handle it. Um, when you give them whole words to read, it's way too much. And we talked about that, that it's just way too much for them to remember. So decodable readers, let them own their reading. Here's an example of it. So, um, you can see here, we is probably a sight word at this point for them because I don't think they have the open syllable yet. This is a CVC word, CVC, uh, CVC word, the is a sight word, grill, uh, in is probably a sight word in this program, but you see how decodable these are? Set is a sight word. 
um, all right, they've had the uh, vowel V dash E pattern here. There's the word said. Okay, very decodable. I know these might look boring to you, but when a kid can read this word, these words, and get it right, that's more rewarding than them looking at a picture and guessing. So they get it, they own it, they're proud of themselves. What I sometimes do is cover the pictures up and it's easy to do. This is Primary Phonics by Education Publishing Service. I've used this for a long time, probably 30 years I've been using this series. It's um, again, very sequential. You know exactly what you're going to teach. Um, and kids like it. So, okay, so if a child makes a mistake, um, let's see here. Okay, I wanted to go back to decodable text. I, um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. I went off on a tangent. Okay, 40% uh, of students come to school in, with intact phonemic awareness. So 40%. Those kids need less structured literacy, but that leaves 60% of the students that need this direct instruction. So 60% of our kids will benefit from this. Using decodable text helps kids map sounds to words. Okay, that's my little soapbox. Okay, so error correction. So we don't want kids looking at the picture to take their, we don't want them taking their eyes off the word. So don't, don't do that. Um, if the word is not decodable, just say the word. Only if that child has not had exposure to that rule that you're expecting them to know. So for example, if you're reading a book and they come to the word um, feed, F-E-E-D, and they have not had the double E, you're going to give them that word because you can't expect them to know something they haven't learned. But if they've learned that pattern, then they should be able to sound it out. You're going to make you're going to help them that way by determining whether or not you should help them or not. If the word is yacht, okay, you're going to tell them that. Why? Because that, that truly is a, a sight word. You, you just have to know that one. There's no way you're going to sound that one out. If the word is decodable, help the student sound out the word. Okay, and you can read the rest, okay? All right, I'm going to get kind of, oops. All right, let's, let's see here what we got. Okay. All right, now, here's the big question. It's not based on science. Nobody knows exactly when you're supposed to move kids from decodable text to non-controlled text. But here's what I think, for what it's worth. Um, you want to, I, I would agree that you would want to follow these guidelines. Um, one of them is read at least 35 words a minute in decodable text with no more than one error. And if, you, if you're doing CBMs, 35 minutes is like end of first grade for non-controlled text at the lower end. Uh, most first graders should be reading close to 60 words. So this is, um, and this is kind of slow, but for decodable text, um, you know, kids should be able to read that with proficiency. Um, let's see. You want them to read real and nonsense words, CVC patterns, short vowels, definitely they should know, digraphs, blends, the silent E are controlled. Some two syllable words and have high frequency words. Again, this is not based on science. This, is, um, this comes from Readsters, from Hunter and Farrell. Okay. All right. Okay, this is a suggested literacy block of time and so many uh, people that are doing whole language approaches from what I understand is that you have a mini lesson and then the kids are set out to do the either they're set up with the um, 
the cafe or the, um, what's the other one called with the five, um, I can't even think of it now, um, the daily five practice, okay? So, which is not a bad framework for your classroom, but there's so much there that kids have to do independently. And we, you know, they're not there to do it independently. They're there to be taught. So this is a, um, a suggested 90 minute delivery of instruction. So um, you're going to have whole group for 25 to 45 minutes. And these are the areas you wanna cover your phon phonological awareness and phon phonemic awareness, your phonics lesson, some decodable text, and your vocabulary and comprehension. Of course, you would, um, every, every day you wouldn't read the same story or talk about the same vocabulary. You could actually um, switch that off um, depending on what day of the week it is. But down here is where you account for those kiddos in your small group that need specific um, remediation of things. This is where you can do all that individualized down here with your small group and you can rotate the skills that you're working on. Um, there's also a suggested, here's, here's a, oh sorry, there was a suggested, if you go to this site, if you go to literacy, um, this is on, reads, no this is on, um, what's it called? Reading, reading rockets, okay? Okay. So, Let's go to the next one. Here's an example of a structured literacy lesson, the components, and, and again, this is, this is a perfect example of what structured literacy is. You do the same thing every day in the same order. Why is it effective? Because kids know what's coming. They, they, they thrive on it. So you're going to start with your warm-up activity. Uh, this is usually, um, phonemic awareness or reviewing, teacher says listen to the word pin, say the first sound in the word. Again, this is a lot of some phonological awareness. Um, activate phonemic awareness, and here's, here's, the, um, here's what you need to say. They even tell you how much time you should spend. Letter sound correspondence, again, it's that constant review. And then here's the second half of the lesson. Actually, it's one whole lesson, but I divided it. Your letter sound correspondence, your word reading blending routines, I do, we do, you do. Uh, your word work, you know, this is where you could do the, the switching that I showed you, things like that. Dictation, very, 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 very important. You want to integrate what they've learned through reading into and infuse that into their dictation. And then reading. Okay, I know this seems like this, you're not gonna get all this done, but this is a 30 minute lesson. Uh, let's see, 10, I think it is 10. Yeah, this is 30 minutes. So if you have 30 minutes for, um, if you're an interventionist, this is ideal. This is, now the site I got this from is the, um, the one from West Virginia. All these, let, all these lessons are made for you. You don't have to do a thing. It's all done for you. And I believe this came from the Reading First work. So I would highly suggest you go to that and check it out. You know, if you're new to this, you can find um, things to do. Okay, now this is a 15 minute intervention lesson sample that, uh, that, um, is through Literacy How. And there's one thing that really bugs me about this lesson is that this woman, when she is teaching, when she's, when the boy is reading, she taps her pencil. And I don't know what that's about. And no, I wrote to them and they couldn't tell me what that was about, but it must be some sort of method that, I don't know, that talks about identifying a word, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I wouldn't recommend that you do that because it's just super annoying and I don't see the point in it. But anyway, here's a nice example of what, what you can include in your lesson. Okay, sound walls. All right, what's the big deal about sound walls right now? Okay, um, 
So I think sound walls um, should be used in your classrooms only if you're going, only if you understand the science behind it. So we know, okay, so we all learn to speak first, right? We learn to speak first. Uh, reading needs to go from speech to print, not print to speech, which is what we're doing when we say, learn this word, that's, um, that's print to speech. We wanna go from speech to print. And so when, we, so when we're asking kids to remember all these words, this is going to help them remember, okay, the letter E says E, it can also say E, um, and how do we spell those sounds? Some, some word, some um, sound walls have the, the alternate spellings underneath them. That would be what I would do if I was teaching because, you know, for example, the long A has like seven ways to spell A. You know, it could be A by itself, A with the final E, A-I, A-Y, E-A, E-I-G-H, E-I and E-Y. So you want to give kids all those options as to how they would spell those sounds. Uh, again, it, you just don't slap this up on your wall and call it done. You've got to teach this directly. And if you do it right, you will get kids going to the sound wall, checking out the sounds of how it's made, checking their mouth, their tongue position, their lip position to make sure they're making it correctly. Uh, that's why a set of mirrors in your classroom is probably a good idea too. Okay, let's see here. Um, some more suggestions. You want to, you want to um, infuse lots of language in your classroom with high quality text. You want to read to your kids. You want to develop those vocabulary words when you're if, if you only give them what they can read at their levels, that's where they're going to stay. So you can't, you, you can't, just because they can't read more does not mean they can't understand more. So we want to just um, you know, have them soak up the language around them and to, to improve their oral language, their vocabulary and their background knowledge. Okay, you can read, so I'm gonna skip those. Uh, this is a document, Guidance for Educators Using a Balanced Literacy Approach. It's a pretty extensive document. It's, it's all these are links. Um, and it talks about what you can do. If your classroom, if you have to do this, here are some options to infuse more of the science of reading into your classroom. Okay, and let's see what else here. Um, so here are some resources for you. The scienceofreadinginfo.com. Um, this is a COVID project. Um, we did, my husband and I did early on in this year. Yeah, we spent hours doing this. We had nothing better to do. And um, so what I did was I started a beginner's tab for people that are just starting out in, in the science of reading. So if you go to this site, there's a beginner's tab and there's so what I did was I culled what I thought were some of the things that a beginner would want to use, would want to understand why we're doing it, what the science is all about, and, and how I can understand it better. Uh, Pam Casters has a Padlet. Here's the link to it. Now, a Padlet is a collection of resources, but what's cool about it is, is that it's all in little pictures. So it's very visual, um, and she... Uh, if you don't know Pam, she is head of the, Phila the Pennsylvania uh, Technical Assistance something something, and she's in charge of the state and all this all this uh, training. So, and she's amazing. That's a woman that does not sleep. She she just doesn't sleep. She puts all this stuff together. This is a new one. The virtual teaching with science of reading um, is a. It's called the Hub. Um, and I'm going to click on it because. I think right now for where we're at in our, in our state of affairs, this hub will, is the answer to your prayers if you don't know how to teach uh, virtually. This will really help you understand 
uh, will give you great ideas. Some of the lessons are all made already. It's all virtual. Um, it's these people should have halos around them. They're just it's just amazing. And it's so well done. And what's so cool about it, it's virtual and it's the science of reading. So it hits both things that that we're looking for. Okay. Um, finally, um, here are all the references that I have. But if you go back, everything's linked to all these different sites. Um, the one I didn't mention is, it's really good. And it takes like an hour to go through it. It's slide, I think it's hot, slide 13, Holly Lane, University of Florida Equipped for Reading presentation. Uh, she did about an hour presentation this summer and it was all about early reading um, and it's really well done. So I would suggest you look at that one. Okay, and finally, I wanna thank my friend Jeannie, who's my <laughs> science of reading soul sister. Uh, Jeannie and I met, um, finally met this summer, but we had been virtually uh, befriending each other since, I don't know, it was October maybe? Yep. And she's from Wisconsin. And um, so it's, it's all good. And as you know, in this journey, you're going to meet lots of people along the way. And um, we're all in it together to help the kids. That's, that, that's what we're all about because we all want what's best for kids. So it's, a, it's, it's an exciting journey. It's a lot of work. It's not easy, but you know, hey, it's worth it. We're saving lives. I really believe that. So anyone have any questions? I was gonna say, Donna, why don't you stop recording? Okay. Uh, so then that's, everybody gets that. Hang on, I gotta figure out how to do that. I don't, stop share, I don't know, maybe, yeah. Oh, look at that. Stop yeah. recording.